Hello everybody. Okay, today I'm gonna to do some painting for you. And I hope you find this helpful. A little bit of a different take or a different approach, but um, a lot of differences, but a lot of similarities too, to other paintings I've done, my overall technique I want to discuss, and different approaches uh, to get there. So, um, first thing I know you're gonna say is, oh my God, look at all that drawing. Yes, I'm gonna address that, <clears throat> but I wanna say up front, it isn't, uh, it isn't necessary or necessarily the right idea to ever draw this much in preparation for doing a watercolor because the tendency can be to tighten up, paint in every little detail, and become very rigid, technical, and dry. <clears throat> and I can assure you, that is not my plan for this painting. Better to show rather than tell, so I will uh, hopefully paint it success successfully. And you can see that what's really going on here is sort of an amalgam between different techniques, drawing, specificity, suggestion, a lot of different watercolor techniques, and in a sense, this is intended to be more, at least as much as of a drawing as it is a painting. And uh, the painting I intend to do fairly lightly so that the, the pencil work becomes part of the overall finished work, shows through a bit more than in some of my other um, looser, more sketchy works. But backing up, what are we painting? Well, uh, that's an easy question, not quite an easy answer. I don't want this to be mistaken for a painting of an object. This is a statue, and this is a building, obviously. The subject of this painting is really neither one of those things. It, the subject of this painting really is intended to be the dialogue between this object, that object, objects in general, and the negative space that they inhabit. So this is really intended to be a painting about space, negative space, and the uh, positive shapes that define the contours of it. I know that might seem a little detached or theoretical, and yeah, maybe it is, but it is the way I approach most of my work um, that contains architectural subject matter. I never want to, um, well, I won't say never. I almost never want to do anything that could be construed as a portrait of a building or a painting that's about um, just a thing. It has to be, for me, about something else, about an idea rather than just a thing. I'll discuss more on that once I get painting, but I want to talk a little bit just about the genesis of this image. The objects that are concerned are beautiful St. Patrick's Cathedral here in New York City. Um, this is Fifth Avenue, for those of you who haven't been here, and this is beautiful St. Patrick's uh, Roman Catholic Cathedral. It's one of the most imposing buildings anywhere, but certainly in New York, it's uh, remarkable. Was designed by James Renwick Jr. in around the late 1870s, I believe, around 1880 and I believe it opened to the public in the early 1900s. It's a very neoclassical, neo-Gothic style, um, very beautifully done and detailed. But again, that's not the subject so much. Um, the counterbalancing object is just across the street. This is a statue, a bronze statue in front of Rockefeller Center just on Fifth Avenue. Now this is the bronze sculpture of Atlas. This was uh, created in, by Lee Laurie and Rene Chamberlain, I believe the name is, around 1937, I believe. So very modernist. The uh, cathedral, of course, is very anti-modernist, very neo neoclassical very much looking forward um, 
into the modernist era. That's also in part what this painting is about, as all of my paintings are. They're um, an exploration of contrast, not just light versus dark, um, but of different ideas. The idea here that's contrasting is modernism versus classicism. Can they work in harmony? And also, as I said earlier, positive shapes versus the negative shapes that give them contour and definition. So these two objects are in really obvious dialogue across Fifth Avenue, one to the other. And I've always just been taken with the, how different they are and yet uh, how in many ways they work together beautifully. And that's really the subject of this painting, how opposite things don't have to end up in conflict or argument. They can somehow find an accord and a way to work together. Technically, I um, did this little sketch on site. This is a relatively accurate placement of the statue to the, to the cathedral. Of course, as in all of my work, or any of yours, I hope, you should feel the freedom to move things around as you wish to make a better image. In this particular case, I was just blessed with the, with the actuality that this statue is literally almost on axis, I believe, to the front portal of the cathedral. So it's a relatively accurate depiction of the placement of things. So we have very traditionalist vertical composition, um, golden mean, you know, roughly one third of the energy up from the bottom, roughly one third in from one side or the other. Um, as always, I compose my work by thinking about two sets of three things, a foreground, a midground, a background, a midtone values, dark values, and light values. For any of you who've taken my course, you know that I try to assign a value to a, a spatial relationship. And they're not always the same. You could mix these values up however you wish. You could have dark in the background, dark in the midground, dark in the foreground, and the same with light and midtones. Scramble them up however you like. But I think this type of layering of values is the most poetic narrative rich way to imply depth, three-dimensionality, and perspective in your work. So I don't always put dark elements in the foreground, but I do often, if I'm honest, I do that. It does work. Um, it can be make a very theatrical sort of statement. In any case, you'll see as I get painting what I have in mind, but this illustrates it pretty well. The lightest lights I want to save here along the street and the lower facade of the cathedral. So this bit, despite how much it's drawn, uh, is going to be painted not all that much, mostly saved white of the paper. The top part of the painting from there up and a bit of the bottom from there down, as well as some of the background over here, is all going to be in various various tones of um, mid-tone. And then the darkest elements, as I said, are going to be this sort of the silhouette of the Atlas sculpture and some of the people on the street forming this reverse L shape. Hopefully well done, but interesting uh, dark shape that will form the foreground. Light will form the midground. Mid-tones will form the background. Very, very simple value design, but simple, but hopefully effective. Because of all the intricacies and little bits and pieces of things here, I wanted a very straightforward, dependable, uh, simple design of values just uh, to help hang all the visual elements of this together. So uh, again, despite how intricate this looks, it isn't necessarily all that precise or accurate. I did want this filigree of detail because I'm going to paint this fairly lightly, as I say, and I want a lot of this line work to read through. But again, it's not as much an architectural drawing as it may appear. It's not that precise or accurately done. It's there just hopefully to give the flavor and the sense of this beautiful place 
and um, this underlay of filigree and, and detail. I do love to draw, that's probably evident, and I don't uh, see that as a downside. I see that as, a, as an upside, but again, I have to caution myself as well as you to be a little cautious if you draw your under sketches too much because it can dominate. So again, just to repeat myself, what I intend to do here is a lighter painting overall where the drawing will show through. And so hopefully the final work will work as a kind of uh, framework and tie together the skills of drawing with the skills of painting. So I'm not gonna deny the drawing. I want to um, have it work in concert with um, the painting. To keep the painting simple, I'm going to do it in um, very few colors, almost monotones, uh, tonalities of warm, um, complemented with a few of cool, but dominantly it will be warm. So yellows, browns, earthy tones, that's what I have in mind. I'll just get started here. So I want to, uh, again, all of the background, I want to wash out in mid-tones. This is my, one of my favorite brushes, which is not a brush at all, of course, just my little mist bottle. But of course, one of the easiest ways to just apply pure moisture, water, to the paper, and the reason I do that is it color, any color, any value, touches the unpainted paper, you're gonna end up with a line if the paper is dry. And I don't want that here. I want this to gradually just become, to gain value as it rises up the page. I started off, it doesn't look quite like it. I started off this, light wash with a little bit of Naples yellow. And I'm keeping it yellow, but I'm washing it up into a, a more of a raw sienna at the top of the page. So it'll still maintain this overall light, um, warm tone, but just gain a little tiny bit of value at the top of the page. Uh, no, I'm not going for necessarily anything realistic or an accurate depiction. This is uh, the very top, a little bit of raw umber, the light, earthy brown tone. These are all very light colors, so nothing really too intense or saturated yet. I always think of these initial washes as just carving the light. And I always describe watercolor as a subtractive technique, meaning we start off with 100% of the white, which is all generated from the white of the paper, and we begin to carve away or subtract some of that light by the tonalities we add. I painted it upside down because uh, gravity is the other free tool we all have. I paint at a about a 20 degree angle. If I'm alone in the studio or on site, I'll even paint much steeper than that, but I wanted this to show up on camera, so it's a little flatter than I normally do. And I keep my paper affixed to stretcher boards that are not attached to the easel so that I can tilt them up to gain more gravity when and if I need. I'll lay them down flatter if I want less. So I missed that just to help join all those subtle colors together. I gave it a little bit more gravity to help pull the water down the page a little bit more quickly. And that just helps all these colors join uh, together more, um, 
organically. Turn those back around. Uh, the downside of doing that is whatever you're painting, these large wet graded washes, if you flip them the other way around too quickly, you run the risk of some of this tonality backwashing and causing some streaks and lines. So I don't want to wait, so I'm going to risk it, but I think it should be okay. Just so you know, today I'm painting on, um, this is Baohong, rough surface paper, 300 grams or 140 pounds, same thing. It is a half sheet in size, so 22 overall by 15 left to right. Not a massive painting, but not too small either. So, yes, um, people ask me very often, how do you paint light in watercolor? And the answer is always, you don't. You don't paint light. The light's there, as I said a moment ago. The light's already there in the white of the paper. What we do in watercolor is we paint the shades and the shadows to give light its um, identity. And that seems maybe like wordplay, and it kind of is, but it's also true. And when you recognize that and accept that, you begin to think about painting in watercolor, I think, a little differently. When you realize you don't paint the light, but you really only paint the shades and the shadows, you begin to uh, understand that you need then to give the shades and the shadows a little bit more thought, a little bit more emphasis in, um, in the way you consider them. Uh, for me, it means I want to make my shades and shadows a little bit more beautiful, a little bit more translucent, a little bit uh, more transparent when, when that's appropriate. And I most especially don't want my areas of shades and shadows to be uh, gloomy, dark, un unconsidered, boring parts of the painting. They're really the only parts of the painting when you think about it. So um, as much translucency, transparency as the painting demands, that's what you should be uh, considering for your areas of shade and shadow. So as far as coloration, as I said, uh, the sky tones were Naples yellow up into a raw sienna, tiny bit of raw umber up at the very top just to sort of anchor the top subtly. Down here, I'm using similar tones. I'm just gonna wash out the bottom in a mid-tone, but I'm dropping in some of this darker, um, this is a mineral violet by Holbein. So yes, it's violet, but it's not as aggressive as many purple tones can be, and it's very, um, very transparent. So these are all still mid-tones, of course, nothing too assertive yet. I'm just um, gradually building up to the darker tones, which are the last to go. Yeah, I always work my paintings up from the darkest to the lightest tones. I mean, opposite of that, the lightest to the darkest tones. The lightest tones, again, are the pure white paper. And do I always save some area of completely unpainted white paper? No, but almost always, yes, I do. Um, makes my job easier, but also I just think a little bit of untouched white paper in your work is not always the right way to go, but always I think worth considering because it helps just psychologically anchor the work into the medium from which it derives. It's a little bit of a permanent orange, a Daniel Smith color. Um, I'm using all Daniel Smith pigments unless otherwise noted. 
the mineral violet uh, by Holbein is an exception, but um, an imperial purple by Daniel Smith is a pretty good um, substitute for that. And as far as brushes so far, I'm only using the one. I'll be using others, but for now, this is a larger to mid-size muck brush, a number four. This is a Neef, uh, my signature brushes made by Neef Company out of Australia. These are fantastic. They hold loads of water. They are synthetic bristles, but they behave uh, much like natural hair. Um, modern brush technology has advanced enormously. And Escoda, Neef, other companies I'm sure make, um, make synthetic haired brushes that behave virtually indistinguishable from natural hair brushes, but obviously avoid any of the uh, damage to animals that, that can sometimes happen with brushes. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if maybe I could have done a more detailed value study and saved a little more light on this podium. I don't want it to be light, light, but yeah, I think it would be fine. Again, I want this whole shape to tie together, but there will they'll pick up some glints of light. The only real saved light will be in a band through the painting here, again, along the base of the, the cathedral itself. Right. So next step is slightly darker mid-tones. That will be whatever I'm going to do on the facade of the cathedral. There are some of these background buildings which are not terribly crucial to the composition, but I do want them there. They'll help They'll help flesh it all out and make it look more solid, I believe. So, uh, the sky wash I did first is setting up nicely, but it isn't quite ready. I'm not quite ready to apply paint to it. Uh, if you want to hold an edge, whatever you've already painted needs to be pretty nearly dry, not necessarily 100%. If you want a softer edge, of course, don't worry about it, paint wet into wet. But I do think I want to try to hold an edge here. I'm going to fade the towers out as they rise up into the sky, but uh, I do want a bit of a crisper edge. I have, a, I have an idea for them. These are some, some of the background buildings. I'm just going to try to rough them in with this half inch flat, no detail at all, and I don't need to hold an edge because this statue will be quite dark by the time I'm finished. Always a good idea in watercolor to only have, if you want an edge, to just have one edge. It's difficult to match two edges without it looking um, well for lack of a better term, bad. So it's better to lap your edges. The lighter under, the darker over the top, and then you read just the one edge. Stepped away for a second. I just got, with the generosity of the Escoda company, a whole set of these beautiful new versatile flats, half inch, three quarter, and quite a number of these beautiful new travel brushes and the versatile series, Prado and Perla series, again by Escoda, which they sent me to try out. So I'm eager to do that. I didn't used to use flat brushes at all for years, but in recent times, I've become pretty addicted to them. 
I love them, especially on the rough surfaced paper. They allow me to do these beautiful dry brush effects that I was never able to achieve before using um, rounds or mops. The flats are the best way to do it for me and also not just for architectural subjects, but they're especially useful in that context because they allow me to paint in a way that I think implies detail without actually being any detail. Without actually having to show anything, you can imply a great deal. And what's better than that? It's a lot easier. So here I'm just using some raw umbers, um, a little bit of this mineral violet. I'm not trying to make those buildings look in any way accurate, just adding some tonality to help anchor the sides of the building and make them look a little bit um, implying as if they could be buildings without getting too detailed or really detailed at all, not necessary. That should be fine. Um, there's some trees I want to work in to the sides. I think another sort of sub-story or sub-narrative I could work in here would be the, the contrast between the built environment and the natural world. And uh, sure, atmosphere does that, but the addition of some foliage will also help. Adds more texture and you can use them to help flesh out your composition as well. All right, I think uh, the sky beyond is dry enough. Well, now I'm gonna just tackle the facade of this cathedral and see if I can be true to my plan to make it um, light and undetailed and allow the drawing to pull it through for the most part. I think I can, I think I'm clever enough to do that going to require me to move the painting around a bit, so I apologize, but I really recommend you not be afraid to move your painting around to make it easier to reach, or again, as I said earlier, to allow the paint to run in certain directions, whatever makes your painting life easier, think about it. This is going to be largely dry brush work, so not a lot of running will be in evidence here. I'm using um, bits of raw sienna and a little bit of raw umber, pretty light stuff. This half inch Escoda brush. It's gonna be a lot of dry brush on this painting. Obviously, a flat brush allows you to hold an edge pretty well. Yeah, I don't think it needs much more than that. I just want to imply the towers, the spires of this cathedral climbing up and sort of vanishing into the mist of the sky. Some of you may be asking, is there a sun direction or a time of day you have in mind? And I can make it up and say yes, but not really. I'm going for an overall sort of ethereal effect. I don't really want a particularly strident sun angle, although there will be one because I think I need to add some shades uh, on the sides of some of these forms to give it a more convincing 3D effect. So to that end, uh, yes, I think there will be an um, implication of some light sun directionality from this side to this side. But I don't want it to look like a very bright, glaring, sunny day. More like an early morning view, perhaps, or even early evening. Sometimes it's very, very important for me to address in a painting and other times like here, it's just really not. 
because everything in this painting is so vertical. The elements that make up the composition, the cathedral itself and the statue, um, and of course the vertical composition. I wanna keep this dominant vertical energy going throughout. So to add any really strident lines of sun coming in from a different angle, not wrong, but I think they need to be played down and kept to a minimum. It's such a beautiful building. Um, obviously, it isn't uh, real Gothic. It's not from the 14, 1300s, but it, uh, it's a pretty good homage to those ancient buildings. And it's pretty old, at least by American standards. We have very few things older than a couple of hundred years. But uh, I'm not a particularly religious person, but I'm very, very moved by um, religious architecture of all sorts. And the reason is because often um, municipalities, cities, patrons, clients pulled out all the stops to hire the best, most gifted artisans, architects, artists, and to create some truly outstanding structures that are beautiful as objects, but also really amazing examples of um, the power that architecture can have to, to tell stories, to motivate and inspire us. Um, I've been involved in architecture all my life, but of course it's always for me the, the narrative power of architecture that moves me the most. Meaning any building isn't necessarily that interesting, but it's the people that work there, worship there, live there, interact with it, with these pieces of uh, living sculpture. It's their interaction with people and the stories they can tell and the emotions they can um, inspire within us that are that I find most interesting, especially as a painter. So while I'm blabbing away, I'm counseling myself to paint this thing as little as I can as lightly as I can. But as it gets a little bit further down into the page, it'll pick up, I think, a little bit a higher degree of saturation and potential detail here before it fades out. So I'm using a slightly stronger um, saturations of raw sienna and then here and there I'm just dropping in a little bit of that Daniel Smith permanent orange that I used down there. Definitely don't want to overdo it. But I'm trying to get uh, this building to have an overall subtle uh, warm glow to it to look almost as if illuminated from within which I think is safe to say, may be the goal of many uh, in a classical or religious-based structure. But again, I have to remind myself that this building is not the star of the show. I want it to look there, but not there, if that makes sense, to almost look like it's emerging from the mist. So it needs to have a presence, but sort of a, a more ethereal, ghost-like feeling to it. Also, it's in the background, so I want it to not pull forward in the composition 
more than necessary because it's further away than the statue. So if you want something to look far away in your work, um, if you manipulate the edges to be softer, that'll help. If you desaturate the colors, that'll help. If you de-emphasize the value range, that'll certainly help. And if there's any detail at all that you intend to put in your work, um, you can put it anywhere, of course. But just psychologically, something that's more detailed tends to pull forward and look a little bit more foreground based than something that's much less detailed. I can think of a thousand uh, exceptions to that, but very often that is the case, and the way to make something look far away is just to de-emphasize in any way you can. So, so far I'm generally happy with that. I think uh, I'm using this half inch flat, so I'm Sort of implying some edges, I'm painting over some others. I'm trying to get it to create this overall sense of it coming in and out of focus a little bit and being, uh, as I said, there but not there. Definitely a presence, but a little bit farther away. So far it's okay. Of course, here I know I need to maintain as much light as possible. As you work on your painting, if you're very protective of your light, you can begin eating away at it if you think the painting can afford it. But of course, you can always subtract light. Very hard to uh, regain it or to add it back in. I'm not at all opposed to adding bits of white, opaque, or scrubbing or scraping or any of those techniques. I tend not to do them too much. I just think uh, I like the challenge of trying to preserve the light as much as I can, but I also think it just looks more, more at home in an overall transparent medium if you don't use a lot of gimmicks or add a lot of opaque medias. So you see, I'm just judiciously uh, subtracting away little bits of that light, but hopefully not too much. I'm gonna try this uh, Escoda flat. It's a number 10, a Prado series. It's a bit smaller, so I think I can articulate some of these uh, more narrow gaps. Such an interesting problem. I'm trying pretty hard not to uh, be overly particular, but I want my shapes to be as elegant as possible without in any way looking like a rendering of a building. And I guess I would describe the difference there as the rendering of a building is often, not always, but often a celebration of all of its details. It really puts the building literally front and center and makes it the star of the show. I'm always trying not to do that. I'm trying to celebrate architecture by seeing it as a part of an overall context of an experience, of a human experience. Um, that was always my problem in architecture. I just love the power architecture had, but I wasn't, I wasn't as interested in actual buildings as I was in, necessarily anyway, as I was in the power of the drawn or painted image of buildings. The ideas of architecture excite me, often much more than the actuality of it. Ah, uh, I don't know. That's the subject for another day, I suppose, but a little insight into my psychology. So in a way, with the right attitude, the amount of drawing I did is actually helping me speed up and paint more quickly 
not slowing me down because I'm trying very hard not to paint within the lines, but just to use them as a as a, an ally into this overall image I'm trying very uh, assiduously to create. My goal is going to be, um, as it often is, not to over detail it and to stop before it's over baked. I think for this painting to be successful, stopping a little sooner than I might normally while handling a subject like this is going to be critical. A lot of the potential success is going to uh, lie in what I imply rather than what I actually paint. But anyway, so far so good. I have to make a little bit of something out of the, the entry. There's a, a one of these massive bronze doors I've shown as partially open and um, it's in the distance, but I do want to play that up. I just think that'll that'll help establish more of a narrative and a sort of a, a path along the uh, Z axis, the X axis, the Y and the Z would be going into the painting, this illusory axis that pulls the viewer along in the three dimensions. So I want to add um, some light, but some deeper shadows on these deeply inset Gothic doors. And that's fine, but it's also a little bit of a, a landmine because I could uh, easily start getting way too detailed here and I don't want that. So yeah, I think that kind of that kind of feeling works pretty well for me. I'm using a tiny bit of cobalt blue dropped into the violet along the edges in hopes that it will complement the warms of the um, the umbers and the siennas. Uh, I'm going to use a smaller version of that larger Neef mop I showed you earlier. This is um, part of the same series, but a, a number um, five zero, so pretty small. And I'm allowing myself to indicate just a little bit of detail around this rosette window. And it looks fine, but again, I'm, I'm a little nervous that it could just very quickly start looking over detailed, so I want to back off. Now again, here the uh, this large door is open, and I want it to look as such. So a darker tone there. I think here, however, I'll toggle back to a more um, to a warm family. This is some raw umber. So again, not really very dark, but sort of a, a mid, mid-tone. Drop in a little bit of violet into it to go toward a darker mid-tone here and there. And I'm painting pretty specifically, which is okay, but scaring me a bit. So just finish that out. I think that's okay. If that looks too dark or specific later, I can I can soften it, but I think I can live with that.
here I want to apply some of the shadows against the, um, the building or shadows it's casting of itself. Just some of the major elements, not all of them. I mean, yeah, I could go crazy and detail this thing to within an inch of its life. And I think for a different kind of painting, that would be okay. But I think for this painting, again, it would really be a mistake. This is just raw umber. Just a me medium friendly warm tone. Yeah, again, I like it, but I think it's uh, getting a little dark and a little specific, so. I'll lighten that. I think I'll just wait and come back to this area. Well, no, I think I should continue with the major shadows. And then before I do any more of this sort of detail umber work, I'm going to uh, wait till I finish up some of the other darker parts and then reassess to see how much it really needs. Here in the city, um, there's another cathedral, St. John the Divine, way up on the upper, upper west side, that I think has been under construction for the last, oh, I don't want to misquote, but at least 100 years or more. And it's, to my knowledge, not yet complete. But uh, for the most part, they're using very traditional uh, building methods, stone carving, sculpture, all that kind of thing that um, seems to just be um, completely outmoded. So it's pretty fascinating. And I know I believe it's the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. is another that has employed uh, traditional methods of construction, stonework, etc. I love modernist buildings, don't get me wrong, but often. Um, It's the desire for excellence that I most love. Most classic or neoclassic buildings, uh, it just was assumed that's what they were going for. For them to succeed, there needed to be a, just a certain level of excellence, quality, skill, craftsmanship in, in their design and their construction. And a lot of modernist design just fell victim to uh, budget cu cuts, expediency. And so a lot of modern design, I think it's a bad reputation for being less than or shabby. Um, no, it's not, doesn't have to be the case. Anyway, this isn't a lecture on um, Modernism versus classicism, that's, 
an argument. I'm happy to have other people, but I don't have to have it with you. I guess my only point is, I think there's room for both, as long as um, they're well-intentioned and the desire for excellence is there. So I'm doing my very best to keep everything I paint on this, as little as it is, pretty squarely in the mid-tone family of values. Nothing very dark yet. The darkest darks, again, are going to be preserved for this foreground area of the painting. Just my knowing that helps me so much. Um, I know for any of you who have watched my other videos that I'm always harping on the value of doing a preparatory composition value sketch, and I can't deny it, I am. I just don't think there's any single thing that's more useful, more helpful, a better use of your time. Because even just that little sketch, I mean, I had a pretty good idea in my head what I wanted to achieve, but just doing that little sketch just um, it's a constant reminder knowing that all of this is mid-tone so anything I do on here that's pure white has to be considered and anything I do that's very dark really has to be considered it's probably not going to be right if it's too light again it's easy to uh, subtract but if it's too dark well all is not lost but it's just a lot harder to address. Yeah, I like this. Um, these new flat Escoda brushes are nice. A flat brush is very helpful for me and uh, these dry brush marks because because uh, for the most part, they simply by design cannot hold as much water as a round or a mop. So they're gonna run out of water a little quicker and you can get these really beautiful, I think sophisticated um, effects. And on rough surface paper, these beautiful implications of detail and texture that are really hard to get or impossible with another sort of brush type. If I would give you any tips for dry brush, uh, pressure and speed are the two biggest things to consider. And then how much pigment do you put in the brush itself? If you put less, it's gonna run out quicker. If you put a lot more, you're gonna be able to go a longer way before it starts to run out. Um, then, as I said, pressure, if you push down very hard, it has a different effect. If you lift up, a much more subtle light effect. Very, very easy technique to learn, though. I mean, you can just, in an hour, on a piece of scrap paper, just play around with pressure. And then I mentioned speed, too. That's another thing. If you go very slow, you're likely to get a more solid line. If you go very fast, you're likely to get more of those more energetic expressions. That's a very simple thing to teach yourself. Just do that or do that. And yeah, you'll have a very different effect. Um, yeah, I think overall, I'm liking the overall presence that the cathedral has. It's not yet looking too heavy or too overbaked. It could easily start, so. Schooling myself as I go along because, uh, yeah, if I weren't so aware of what I'm trying to do overall in this image, 
I could so easily get lost in just drawing and painting every little detail and trying to make it so precise. But I know that that would not necessarily make for a better painting. Just a tighter, more detailed one. Which is sometimes exactly what you want, but very often is not. So it just depends on your intention. Another one of the brushes they sent me is, um, this is a, another Prado series travel brush, but a number six, so a flat, but very small. I don't have any flat brushes this small, so I think I'm gonna love them. Oh yeah. Very quick and easy way to just implies some other um, character without literally rendering anything. Yeah, that's nice, this little brush. I think maybe I'm getting close to doing enough on this. Again, I want to start to lay in the darker tones. Then I can come back nearer the end and begin to flesh, uh, <clears throat> flesh out this uh, as I think it needs. Right now, I'm not 100% sure how far to go with any of this kind of character work. None of it is what I'd call bad, but it could easily be too much. So I'll do some of the major moves on this bigger window up top. I think that's it for now. And then I'm gonna start on the dark tones here. Well, first the trees on either side, the textural elements. There are trees uh, in planters. It doesn't really matter. You can make them whatever you want. And there's some street trees over here. As I remember, I'm going to just uh, invent what I think looks best in the painting. And then there are some lower plantings on the, the base of the uh, the statue plinth, but again, I'll just do what I think the, the painting needs. No need to get too hung up in reality. For trees, I very often use this brush, I'm, or brushes like this, I'm sure. You've heard me talk about these before. Um, they're a liner brush, so they have a fat bottom which holds a good deal of water and then longer quills sticking out of the top so for me they're very useful for drawing um, painting trees areas of trees uh, to keep everything in the warm family i think i'm going to keep these in sort of browns and oranges See if that works. So this is just some raw sienna and a little bit of that um, permanent orange. I don't I don't want this to look too overly orange, so just a little.
So yeah, this brush is very useful because without too much water in it, I sort of lie on it, lay it on its side and just lightly scrape it across the surface of the textured paper. So I haven't drawn in any of the leaves. I've just um, let the brush do it. And with trees, I almost always brush in the areas of trunks and major branches last after I've done the areas of foliage. This way I can just drag the brush over the wet areas of foliage, allow all these to melt together and connect. I'm using one of these Neef very small mops. This is um, a sepia, Daniel Smith sepia, sort of a dark brownish tone. More like calligraphy than anything. I'm just doing what I think these shapes are telling me is a good idea and hoping for the best. too bad. I don't want these trees to be a big deal. They're very supporting cast members, but they're kind of an important textural element, so they matter. But again, I don't want them to dominate, and they're falling in a spatially a mid-ground between the cathedral, which is in the distance, the statue, which is going to be definitely in the foreground. So these have to have a little bit more value to look forward of the cathedral, but definitely a little less value than this is going to have. This is a little bit of a neutral tint. I'm just dropping in here and there to solidify the connections between branches and leaves and to add a little bit of a depth to the bottom of these leaf areas. And I'm using the small mop to add a few little brush marks, I think, if I can help make some of these shapes look a little more elegant and organic. so bad. love painting trees, but the more you think about it, often the worse they look. So it's better to not think too much and just paint them by the seat of your pants using your uh, intuition. Just let them guide you as you're uh, painting. Your painting often knows better what it needs than you do.
So again, these are in some raised planters. No need to go too crazy. I sort of invented them anyway. Don't think they're really there. No, I am not looking at my reference photo. I try very hard after I get started painting to just hide the reference photo from myself or get rid of it altogether. All it's gonna do is slow you down. I have to say, I'm not in love with that orange. It looks a little low. Uh, I don't know, not good. So I grabbed a little bit of cadmium orange light. Hopefully. I wanna add a little bit more brightness. They look a little gray, probably from the neutral I dropped in, but drawing quite gray, but they're a little too dry. So I may just have to live with it. 